There are so many different thoughts that I have on John 14, and this is actually why we are going to spend two weeks inside of John 14. Um, I'm actually going to uh, slow the pace down and sit inside of John 14, 15, 16, and 17. Um, the book of John, some scholars describe it as being a description of creation and recreation, and how the first half of the book, so to say half, not as in literal number, but up to chapter 13, is this working out of showing the state of current creation, and then John 14 forward up through the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the demonstration that Jesus is the new creation, and therefore we, all, we need to be in him. And if you look at the resurrection account, it's emphatic that Jesus steps into a new week, showing a new order and a new life. And so we have in chapters 14 through 17 the meat of what Jesus is trying to get across. We are not, it's not filled with stories, it's filled with his teaching. And so we're going to slow down there and really try to meditate upon what Jesus is teaching his disciples before he goes and is executed publicly and humiliated publicly and then raises from the grave a few days later. And John 14 is a chapter that, as we're orienting ourselves towards it, I want to remind you that last week we covered Jesus washing his disciples' feet. So John 13 is sandwiched between Jesus saying, hey, look, I'm going to be abandoned I'm going to be killed. I'm going to be forsaken. And Peter's like, nah, -uh. Jesus is like, okay, Peter, like, I really appreciate you right now, but even you are going to abandon me. And it's after that, it's in the middle of all that actually sadness that we have the new commandment that Jesus gives in John 13, 34, and 35, that we are to love one another and that this is going to be the mark of disciples. That whenever people around us look at us, they will recognize that we are followers of Jesus by our love for others. And an interesting note is that he says this is a new commandment. Um, and the new part of it is not the loving. I've, hopefully I've shown you that inside of the very fabric of the laws that God gave in the Old Testament, there was to love one another. The, the newness is the fact that it is as I have loved you. So as Jesus has loved us is this new standard that it is a concrete demonstration. So the love is not new. It is the example of Christ that is new. People don't have an excuse. They know what Jesus did. So it steps into this in John 14, 1 through 14. And so read along with me in this passage. Do not let your hearts be troubled. And you believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you may also be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. And they will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father. 
and I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask for me anything in my name, and I will do it. So there's a lot going on here. And Jesus is really trying to regroup and refocus the disciples in the last hours that he has with them to understand the purpose, the aim, the goal of everything that he's been trying to do with them. And as we read this passage, I, I am personally challenged by asking myself the question, when Jesus makes the declaration of being the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father except through me, when I read that and state that, do I allow that declaration to have a full bleed over into everything that it could even imply? Or do I narrow it? And do I try to think of it as just a simple way to say, this is something I believe? Without saying, this is my life declaration. Now, I'm going to explain that a little bit. And we're going to it starts with looking into verses 1 through 4. Because Jesus is trying to preface all of this conversation by orienting his disciples. And he's trying to orient them because he can understand, just as he said, Hey, Peter, you're going to deny me. Hey, guys, I'm going to be killed. He has just said some very stark and troubling things. He said he's going to go. He's going to lead them. And so he makes the statement, do not let your hearts be troubled. Now this is a statement that echoes an entire history, I believe, inside of God's covenant acts with his people. If you remember in Joshua, it is the start of his charge in Joshua 1. And it is the declaration at the end where he says... Be strong and courageous. So, another way to say be strong and courageous is do not let your hearts be troubled. Now, that statement is not a just general statement that Jesus gives. Jesus is not trying to brush aside every single thing that could cause someone to be worried or anxious. Oftentimes, I believe as Christians, we want to jump to a verse in Scripture that then calms our nerves. But I believe that it's more so what Jesus says that after the statement of don't be troubled, that should cause us to have strength and courage rather than just the proclamation of don't be troubled. Because he says... You believe in God, believe also in me. So he's saying, when I'm here, I'm talking, I'm with you. It's not just me on my own. And this is important because this bleeds over into the reality of Jesus. As I discussed with the junior and senior high Sunday school class, whenever we talk about salvation, when we talk about what it means to be saved, well, what happens is we are those who are lost, sinners, living in death and destruction and sickness. There's many different words that scripture uses to describe the state of one who is not in Christ. But then upon being saved, you are taken through repentance, by grace, through faith, into Jesus Christ himself. So think about this as an actual literal physical location change. So think of it as you're either in this building or you're in a different. Now, this is important because it bleeds over into his statement of, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So Jesus is going there and he says, believe in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, I would have, so why would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you if it wasn't true? He says, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Now, this is important because Jesus is trying to say, I'm not leaving to leave you devoid of everything. I'm not leaving to make you feel alone. He's saying, you know that I'm going away on purpose. 
And we see later in chapter 14 that he's sending the Holy Spirit. But not only that, that he's saying, I'm going away, but I'm coming back. Now, there's many different ways that this could be tried, that we could interpret this. We know that at the end of the gospel, Jesus does come back after his resurrection. He spends some time with the disciples. This could be a reference to the end of all things when Jesus comes and makes all things new. Or because we know that the discussion of God being triune inside of this gospel, that he could be talking about the sending of the Holy Spirit. Now, I know I just threw out three really big interpretations that you're like, we're not going to work through all three of those. And we're not. But I want you to think about when you read this passage, you've already probably been taught a little bit of what it means when Jesus says, I'm going to prepare a place and I'm coming back. Know that he says this as a comfort. He says this because it shows that he is in control. He is not going to be caught by surprise and the disciples are not going to be left just defenseless to have whatever happened, and then all of a sudden God afterwards says, Oh, shoot, I promised these disciples I'd be there for them. Now, I'm stepping into the, the modern context to say, so often, I believe we need to reflect upon our, our theology, on our interpretation of Scripture, and ask ourselves, does our understanding of God, His sovereignty, His plans, how things will happen and how things will turn out, does it give us comfort or does it bring forth fear? Because if you read Scripture and you start to have a fear of how things are going to happen, instead of a great confidence in the God who is in control of all things, then you're reading it backwards. Jesus says, do not let your hearts be troubled. And this is right after he's talking about, I'm going to be abandoned. The person that you all think is great and Peter, he's going to deny me. Like, he knows what's going to happen. He's not trying to paint a rosy picture. He's trying to tell them, don't be troubled. And it's this declaration that I believe we need to, we, we unpack it more Whenever we, work, we walk forward into verses 5 through 7, where Thomas is just like, Hey, Lord, hey, Jesus, you're speaking in riddles right now. I mean, like, if we were to, to translate this into current speak, it'd be, Thomas says to Jesus, We have no idea what you're talking about. He's really lost. Now, Thankfully, he asked this question because it leads into some of the greatest discourse inside of the book of John. But I believe it also pushes, I think, on all of us where when we assume we understand what Jesus is talking about, how many times do we need to hear the next verses him actually explain? And so he goes into it. And, and so there's two things. Thomas says, we don't know where you're going. So how? So we don't know where and we don't know how to get there. I mean, this is simple. If I were to say, hey, go to my grandparents' house. You'd say, we don't even know where your grandparents live to know which direction to head. I mean, it'd be something like that. He's just like, give us some help. So Jesus answers, I am the way and the truth and the light. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you will know him and have seen him. So this hits on something that, like, this is both Theology 101 and Christianity 101, but then also Christianity 909. Like, this is as simple as it gets, but then as big and complicated as it gets. The direction that Jesus is going, that he wants his disciples to go, is to the Heavenly Father. Now, that's, that sounds either super simple to you or super like, what are you even trying to talk about? And what this is, the direction that Jesus is going, I believe is the entire emphasis of Scripture, the entire emphasis of John with the new creation and the recreation and him being the new week, the new life, is the fact that so often in everything that we think that it means to be a follower of Jesus, we can be headed not 
towards God, the Heavenly Father, at all. Jesus has had his whole three years to help his disciples understand, hey, this is all about following the will of the Father, doing the will of the Father, being someone who walks in the way of the Father. And the way that we can know the will of the Father, the way that we can go to the Father, the way that we can have truth is actually through Jesus Christ himself. Now, this is a passage that I've meditated a lot on, and it's interesting how in the context that I've grown up in, this has been a verse, along with Acts uh, 14.2, where it's been a way to just bludgeon any sort of... So, in a pluralistic culture, we all we encounter people who try to say things like there's many ways to the top of the mountain, or why do we even care what mountain there is? You know, everyone ends up in the right place in the end. And so people have used this passage as a means to refute those theologies. And I want to say this passage does refute the multiple paths idea, but that's not the emphasis upon which Jesus is getting. This is not about trying to prove other people wrong. This is about asking yourself the question, are you in Jesus to be able to experience truth and life? Does that make sense? This is not a way that he's hatcheting at other people. This is the way that he's answering to his disciple, saying, you want to know where I am going. I am going to the Father. And the only way that you can get to Him is through me. The object and direction is, are you in a right relationship with the Creator God? And therefore able to live out His purposes, seated in Genesis, and echo throughout Scripture of being one who guards and tends, one who's in a right relationship with Him, Right relationship with the world and a right relationship with others. Now, that sounds really heady or that sounds very weird. But Jesus is taking all that the disciples are doing. They're scattered. They're all over the place. Imagine you're sitting there with Jesus. He just washed your feet, which is completely counter everything that the most honored person in a room should do. So he just flipped the script on that. He called you his friend, which a master does not call his underling a friend in the first century. And then he says, hey, I'm going away. You're going to be confused and lost and scared in that room. And he's trying to say, guys, 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 there's so many directions you can go. But everything that you do needs to be centered upon me and how I am going to the Father. Now, the reason why we look at it, and he goes through all this discussion in the next six verses of how believe in me because I am in the Father, the Father is in me, we are one. So if you are believing in me, you're believing in the Father. And if you have believed in the Father prior to me coming to this world, you're actually believing in me. So he's seeing this and it's just like, you know, you sit back and if you haven't been taught about the Trinity since the time you were, you know, knee high and inside a church, your head can spin a little bit. But then he's just like, hey, If you want to get this, if you want to get the point of all that I'm talking about, very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. And they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. Verse 12 really kind of brings his whole conversation into one. So, I mean, I've said this many times before. I have overthinking syndrome. I enjoy reading things that are technical. I enjoy the debates on the dorm room floor about is this dative case in the Greek supposed to be used this way or that way. 
I enjoyed my college papers where we had to grammatically and lexically define every single word in the book that we were translating. I enjoyed that. But Jesus is trying to say, hey, look, if you want to define believing in me and understanding what it means to know the way, the truth, and the life, you will do the works I have been doing. So this steps into then a couple of categories of thought and conversation. One, what was Jesus doing? When we look at the life of Jesus Christ, what do we see his actions as stating and what do we see his teachings as leading forward in doing? So often I believe we can misread our entire faith we can go off on different directions. We can go off on different tangents. And I believe what Jesus is trying to say is believing in him can have effects into every area of our life. But if you let a side tangent of your faith become the path of your faith, are you really... Letting your faith be defined as Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. Or are you letting something else? Now, I will take a step back and apologize if, again, this seems vague or heady or theoretical. But think about this. I am the head track coach of South Fulton Track and Field. There are... I think 17 events and attract me. If I am so, if I am supposed to be the head track coach, but all I care about is the pole vault, will that win the meet? No, you cannot win a meet through an event. But if I am the South Fulton track and field coach and I don't care about an event that goes on, that is bad. So do you see how there's a difference between a hyper-focus or not focus? Jesus is saying, if you believe in me, you will continue in the works. You will do the works that I've been doing. This at the same time, when you, when you link it to verse 6, this frees up your entire Christian walk to be one that's not confusing, but then it also sets the boundaries and the guidelines of saying are you making your faith really about Jesus and the Heavenly Father this can be I believe best demonstrated whenever you go back to the early 1900s there was this this, it, it, this is actually a very hard illustration to give because in the early 1900s, the, there was this group of papers that was published. I actually have them on one of my shelves, and it's called The Fundamentals. The Fundamentals of the Faith, because the modernist movement came out saying, essentially, miracles didn't happen. Jesus wasn't born of a virgin. You can't be born of a virgin. Anything supernatural in Scripture was stripped away and removed. So then, therefore, the fundamentalist statements were all, like, technical academic rebuttals of each of those items. And the modernist movement, it evolved into this statement of saying, salvation is not believing in Jesus, but it's just about making the world a better place. And the fundamentalist movement evolved into being, if you don't believe exactly what we're saying on these 117 articles of faith, then you are not a believer in Jesus. So do you see how those are two tangents of the faith that left the actual way, the actual truth, and the actual life? One faith made it into, are you saying all the right things? And the other faith saying, it really doesn't matter what you believe, we're just trying to make the world a better place. Now, can you make a world, the world a better place without believing that Jesus Christ is central? I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to say something slightly controversial. You don't have to believe in Jesus to pick up trash on the side of the road. Right? 
And trust me, there are lots, there's lots of trash on the side of the road that should be picked up. I used to go for runs and calculate how much money I would make by how many cans I could have picked up on the run. But your faith in Jesus should cause you to do the work of Jesus in this world, which will make the world a better place. But is your life supposed to be about the goal of making the world a better place? Or is your life supposed to be about Jesus and the way, the truth, and the life and going to the Father? By doing that, it will cause your actions to be deeply reflective upon things. You won't disregard or discard the world that the Lord has given you if you believe that this world is a, that this life is about honoring the God who made the world that you live in and gave you the life that you have. But you see how that's deeply rooted in a seeking of Jesus. It's not about hey, stop cutting down trees, or hey, don't do this. It's not, it's not about those things first. Those are supposed to be downstream. Your life is supposed to be about seeking Jesus. And when you seek Him, when He is the way, the truth, and the life, because nothing else is going to get you to the Father. Doing the works of Jesus does not get you to the Father. It is trusting in the work of Jesus. The final complete work of Jesus, that you then are on the direct path to the Father, and you start to say, hey, this is what I believe. This is the life that I'm going to live out. Kind of like, I am a track coach, and I believe that if I want my athletes to run six days a week, I should run six days a week. And do you know what happens whenever I run six days a week? I become a better runner, and my athletes say, hey, if my coach can do it, I can do it. And they're also like, hey, I don't want to be beat by this old man in practice, so then they want to be in shape. It's not because I want to be in better shape than my athletes. It's I want to be an example. Do you see how there's the proper order and the proper direction by which we should have things? So when we talk about Jesus being the way, the truth, and the life, this isn't our way that we go out and someone say, hey, you're a Buddhist, you're an idiot. Hey, you're this, you're... No, that's not what Jesus was doing. Jesus was saying, hey, guys, you believe in me. You say you believe in me. I'm going to the Father. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Echo back to 13. People will know you by your love for one another and for me. So Jesus is exclusively the way to the Heavenly Father. That is irrefutable. That is, I believe that wholeheartedly. But when we read this passage as a way to show someone else how wrong they are and what they believe, I think Jesus is sitting on the side saying, look, how about you show them me? And that will bring them to the Father. So, Inside of all this conversation, it then boils down to a couple of very, I think, theologically tricky and thorny things. Because he says, you're going to do even greater things than me. Jesus says that. And they will do even greater. Those who believe in me will do greater things than these. Working back. Because I am going to the Father. Now... I am not going to settle a theological question that the church has argued about for 2,000 years as to what exactly that should be interpreted as. But I will tell you this. When you believe in Jesus, and you therefore do the works of Jesus, you are stepping on a line that is in an eternal trajectory. You're able to bear witness to the salvation work of the eternal you're able to bear witness to the resurrection and the life. You're able to show people that there's someone who can actually take you from being a selfish, dead person to being an others-focused, live individual, part of the body of Christ. Think about how great of a work that is. And you can bear witness to that. And then, in that lens, it's such forward, and I will do whatever you ask in my name, and the Father may be glorified in the Son. You ask for me anything in my name, and I will do it. All right, verses 13 and 14. All of us have probably prayed something, and it didn't come true. So either Jesus is not true, or you've misunderstood this. 
Now, we like to commonly use the explanation, well, Jesus answers everything. It's either yes, no, or, or later. And I think that that's an okay explanation, but I think we're missing out on the whole point. Jesus is saying, whatever you ask in my name, This is an honor-shame first-century context. You don't walk up to someone and say, I want you to make me great in your name in the first century. That's just not, not going to fly. That doesn't fly now. We have a misunderstanding of what Jesus says when you ask something in my name. It's not a magical incantation at the end of a prayer. Ha-ha, I twisted God into submission to me because I said in Jesus' name. Think about that. We all, we all admit that that is a distorted way, but then we hear people preach. We hear people say, you just got to have more faith. You got to have this. You got to... No, it's... You got to understand what it means to be praying in Jesus' name. That means what you pray is through the lens, through the thought, through the very being of Jesus and how this is something that is for His glory. You will see if you read chapters 13 through 17 how many times the glory of Jesus and the glory of the Father is emphasized. If you're praying in someone's name, you're praying that that person will be able to be glorified and honored by that request. In the first century, someone would do you, something would be done in someone's name, as in a great banquet would be done in someone's name. The whole village would be fed by this person in their abundance, and then you know what the whole village would do? Essentially, we swear our allegiance to this person because this feast came in his name. You'd see the massive statues or you'd see the Colosseum or something like that erected in someone's name. It's for their glory and it's for their honor. It's not just a statement at the end of a prayer. So think through. The content of your faith is seen through the desire, the will, the direction of your prayers. If your life's about Jesus, if your life is about Him and His will and His way, if it's about going towards the Heavenly Father, that means we will think through the things that we want and we'll think about, is this something that is for my name? Or is it for the name of Jesus Christ? Now, this is not my browbeating, this is not my, have you been praying wrong your whole life kind of statement, but this is the, look, when we talk about Jesus being the way, the truth, and the life, and no one coming to the Father except through Him, that means that how we think about our own prayers and our own life and our own actions should be guided towards and directed towards the Father being glorified. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong praying for four touchdowns, Barb. Um, I know six, you know, uh, no field goals. Um, this is, this is not to say, this is not to say, hey, God doesn't want to hear your heart desires type thing. But what this is talking about is a fundamental reorienting, redirecting, refocusing of our life, our desires, and our wills to be towards the Heavenly Father and everything flows downstream from that. So many times we get things misdirected, misguided. Things get thrown out of whack, out of alignment. We make a minor point into a major point, or we make a major point into the point. Jesus is saying, look guys, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And if you've seen me, believe in me, you're going to do my works. And when you're doing my works, you're going to be doing things in my name. The blessing of following Jesus is not that you're going to have a big 401k. It's not that you're going to have children who all comb their hair and brush their teeth and look good in public. It's not the blessing of following Jesus Christ is not having a shinier car than the person next to you. It's 
It's not anything other than the blessing of saying and knowing that you know Jesus. And he is eternally more valuable than anything else because he is the way, the truth, and the life. He is one with the Father. He is in the Father. The Father is in him. Whenever that becomes our sum total thinking, it unlocks so many other items in our life. I mean, how many times do we have to use the illustration of when you when you punish your kids, are you punishing them, punishing them because they're doing something bad? Or is it that they're making you look bad as a parent? Whenever you get in an argument with someone, is it because they're wrong or is it because they confronted you? Whenever you hold an opinion strongly, is it because it glorifies Jesus or because it glorifies you? My friends, Jesus is great. He's greater. Does he promise to tell us, hey, figure it out. Just don't bother me. Or does he say, hey, look, as we're about to go into the next unit next week, I'm sending the Spirit. You've seen my works. You have my word. You have the law. You have a knowledge of what to do. Not only that, we're given, like, this is something that I want to just always reemphasize over and over. We are saved into the body of Christ. It's not like you're saved and you're like, oh no. What do I do? Nobody's done this before. It's, hey, look. You're surrounded by dozens of people who are on the same path towards the Father, desiring to glorify Him, desiring to work out what it means to do the works of Jesus. And so we humbly, lovingly encourage one another to do it. You're not alone. You aren't left alone. And Jesus is going to someday come back and make all things new. And that's a good thing. But until then, we also have the really good thing of doing the even greater than these works that Jesus promises that we can do. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we worship you and we adore you. We praise you for being loving and caring. We ask that as we go about this week, we will um, be about doing the works of Jesus. That our love for one another would show people just how great you are. We thank you for the example of those who have gone before us who did this well. We ask that we be people who also follow.